Let's stand together and take our Bibles now and turn to John's Gospel, chapter 21. John 21. Thank you, Todd, for sharing with us, and thank all of you for being here this morning. And I'm excited about this message today. We begin a brand new series today entitled Pictures of Grace. Pictures of Grace. And we're going to be looking at stories in the Bible of men and women who had the grace of God upon their life in a very unique way. And we're going to start today with a man by the name of Peter. And I want you to find him with me in John chapter 21. We're going to read beginning in verse number 15 and read down for the sake of time to verse number 19 for our scripture reading. If you have time this week, read the whole chapter, but get your notes out. I believe if you follow along with me there, you'll find just about everything you're going to need as far as extra verses and so forth. And again, if this is your second time at Lancaster Baptist, welcome to Lancaster Baptist. We're so glad you're here, and I hope you'll be encouraged by today's message. John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you this morning for the word of God. And for the stories of grace that we're going to be studying these next several weeks. And Lord, today, as we come to this passage, we're especially thankful for the grace in the life of Peter. Help me as I preach about it this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, as we open John 21, the most significant event to ever take place in world history has just happened. And of course, that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we consider the enormity of this, and as we consider the historical nature of it, uh, you would think that all of the Christians would be running around rejoicing and, and uh, happy with what had taken place. The tomb was empty, kind of like we were last week, a uh, resurrected Savior, and you would just think the church would be alive and on fire. And so when you search the Scriptures and you try to find where's Peter and what's Peter doing, you find what Peter's doing, and he's out fishing. He's not preaching. He's not rejoicing. He's not singing. He is fishing. And the truth of the matter is that Peter had really been in a tailspin spiritually for the last several days instead of being at a high point spiritually. Some of you might recall the backsliding of Peter. How many have ever heard that term before, backslidden? Have you ever heard that term? Not a happy sound, is it? Someone, you don't ever want someone saying, well, he's backslidden, right? You don't want that on your tombstone someday. He backslid. No, no, it's not a term you want said about you, but it's often said about Peter at this moment in his life. And some of you remember why. There were several steps to it. And the first one is found in your notes there, Luke twenty two fifty four. It says, Then they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. You see, when Jesus was going to be crucified, they, they took him to the house of the high priest whose name uh, was Caiaphas. And as they went to the house of Caiaphas and walked down that dusty trail and through the stones, they uh, came to his house. And yet the Bible says that along the way there, Peter followed afar off. Let's read that last four words together of Luke twenty two fifty four. Ready, begin. Peter followed afar off. One more time. Peter followed afar. Now, folks, let me just pause and say, don't do that. Stay close to Jesus. You see, you might think it's just missing a little Bible reading, a little church. You might think it's, you know, just not a big deal if you're not as faithful as you once were. 
But it was the first step in Peter's backsliding when he let that distance develop. And then you follow it down to Luke twenty two sixteen. 16. It says, And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. You remember Jesus had said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And boom, immediately he did, and he realized what had happened. And the Bible says in verse 61, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And a lot of times I try to meditate on that. I remember years ago being at Caiaphas' house and, and thinking of this story. And imagine if you had just denied Jesus and he looked right into your eyes at the moment you denied him. And the Bible tells us how Peter felt. It says, And Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, I don't want to bring up bad memories, but there's a difference between maybe a few tears and weeping bitterly. And if you've ever wept bitterly, or if you've been with somebody who has been weeping bitterly, there's something deep going on within their heart at that moment. And Peter had, no doubt, an amazing amount of emotions, perhaps guilt, perhaps conviction, perhaps depression, anxiety, despondency. I don't know what all came over him, but he wept bitterly when he realized, I have just become the fool. I have just done what I said I will never do. And so it is that Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet we read in the Word of God an amazing phrase in Mark chapter 16 and verse 7. When Jesus had resurrected from the grave and the women came to the tomb, the empty tomb, the Bible says there was an angel there who said these words. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter. I want everybody to say that this morning, those two words, and Peter. Ready, begin. And Peter. Go your way uh, and tell all of the disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. I'm glad this morning that I serve a God of the second chance. I'm thankful this morning that Jesus didn't say, forget Peter, he denied me. I'm glad that Jesus didn't say, I'm done with Peter. I'm glad that Jesus is forbearing and long-suffering with all of us. Because if you were honest, just about everybody here this morning would say, you know, there's been a time in my Christian life when I wasn't following as closely as I once did. And sometimes I think I've grieved the Lord. And and, and yet here we see the second chance and the grace of God. It kind of reminds me of a gal that called her friend on the phone. And the lady wasn't there. She just had an answering machine. And the answer machine said something like this, I'm not available right now, but I thank you for caring enough to call. I'm making some changes in my life. Please leave a message after the beep. If I do not return your call, you are one of the changes. (laughs) Now that's kind of how people are, right? You know, you can burn me once, but you will not burn me twice, right? That's never going to happen to me again. We're good at self-protection and self-preservation. And yet here we see that Jesus teaches us that to be in ministry, we must remain vulnerable. Sometimes you're going to help somebody that's going to burn you more than once. But grace keeps forgiving, and grace keeps coming. And Jesus shows us this as he comes to Peter again and again. And that's what I want you to learn, first of all, if you're taking notes this morning, the pursuit of Christ. I want you to see how Jesus Christ is pursuing after Peter. You know, one of the greatest doctrinal truths I ever learned was not in Bible college or seminary. One of the greatest doctrinal truths I ever learned, I learned in Sunday school in kindergarten, and here's what it was. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Long before you were ever born, he knew you and loved you. And he loved you when he died upon the cross. He loved you when he said, it is finished. And here we see Jesus pursuing Peter over and over again. And I want you to notice, it was a personal pursuit. Uh, The Bible says here uh, that Jesus came to him there at the Sea of Galilee. Now, Jesus could have given up on him. He could have waited for Peter to, you know, come and ask for forgiveness. But we read in the Bible in Mark 16, 7, it says, Go get the disciples and Peter. 1 Corinthians 15, 5, he was seen of Cephas. John chapter 20, he appeared to the disciples. And here in John 21, he comes specifically for Peter. And knowing the frailty of Peter's faith, and knowing the tendencies of the disciples to become despondent, Jesus continued after them. And he knows your frailties. And he knows my frailties. And he knows that sometimes we get discouraged and we just want to go fishing. I mean, we want to get out of town. We don't, we don't want to see and face some of the things that we see. And that's why Jesus comes again and again. 
to us in our time of need, in our time of despondency. And it doesn't matter who we are. It could be the Samaritan woman that's been married five times and now in another troubled relationship. It could be Zacchaeus who's hated by the whole neighborhood. Jesus said, I don't care who you are or what you've done. I want you. I love you. I came to redeem you. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It's very personal with Jesus. It's not about having a relationship with Lancaster Baptist Church or, or some denomination. That's not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about a God who loves us so much that he comes again and again and again pursuing us. And some of you have been saved even in recent days. And God didn't give up on you in your 30s or 40s. God didn't give up on some of you in your 50s and, and someone came with a gospel tract or someone talked with you about your need for Christ and finally the light came on and you received Christ as Savior. He's seeking someone else, I'm sure, right at this very moment. Personally, he comes. But we also see that Jesus comes persistently over and over again. Now notice this in our text, verse 15, it says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith uh, to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? Now, Jesus asks this question three times. And the reason he did that, I believe, is because Peter had denied Jesus three times. So three times Jesus says, lovest thou me more? And the word more means with superiority or, or, or with more excellence. He says, Peter, do you love me more than the old life that you've had and your career and all of these things? Peter, you're a great fisherman. Peter, uh, you're a good businessman. And, and you're here back at your business at the Sea of Galilee. And, and I know it was difficult there in Jerusalem when, when you denied me. But, but here you are, Peter, fishing. And I just am wondering, this is kind of where I met you the first time when I said, follow me. Don't you love me more than all of this? Now, we know that Paul loved the Lord with all his heart. The apostle Paul said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Paul said, listen, this world compared to Christ, there's no match. I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that Jesus is coming to Peter with a question of love. Peter, do you love me? And sometimes we need to be asked that question. Do you love him like you should? Are you where you once were with the Lord Jesus? It was a question of love. But it was also a question of values because he said, do you love me more than these? More than these fish, Peter. More than these boats. More than your occupation. I was in the Holy Land a few years ago, and they had resurrected up from the Sea of Galilee this fishing boat, and they were telling us how they embalmed it with wax and how that it was about the same size from which Jesus may have spoken there at the Sea of Galilee and from which Peter would have fished for fish. And, 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 and Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me more than your career? You see, a job is a good thing. How many of you agree it's good to pay bills? It's good to have food to eat. It's good to tithe and give to the Lord. All of that is good, but a job is a lousy God. And sometimes it takes us men longer to figure that out. And Jesus is just saying, hey, listen, Peter, do you love me more than your job? I mean, do you love me more than all of this? Because he tells us very clearly in Luke 16, 13, no man, no servant can serve two masters. You're either going to hate the one and love the other, or you're going to hold to the one and despise the other. No man can serve God and man. And listen, if it's all about the overtime and another job and, and, and this and that, you'll be moving here and there and up and down and missing church and, and, and not drawing nigh to God. Somewhere along the line, you've got to say, nothing matters more to me than my relationship with Jesus Christ. It was a question of his values, and sometimes we refer to this as discipleship. Being a true disciple of Jesus Christ, counting the cost and following him. And so we see the pursuit of Christ. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? But do you love me more than all this, Peter? Do you really love me? I want you to notice, secondly, not only the pursuit of Christ, but it gets a little deeper. It's, it's, the, it's the proving of Peter or a test for Peter. And I want you to see the test in verse 15 again. He says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now, here we see the proving of Peter's love. He's not just going to ask him. He's going to keep asking. And he's going to prove by definition. And let me explain it this way. When Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? He was using a Greek word. It is the word agape. 
And I want you to see that on the slide. Agape love is unconditional love. It's unselfish love. But the first two times when Peter answered back, he said, oh, Lord, you know I love you. And he used the word phileo. And the city of Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. So Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me with the utmost love? Are you my true disciple? Do you love me with unconditional love? And Peter's saying, yeah, Lord, I mean, we're Facebook friends. We're BFFs. And some people talk about Jesus that way. You know, yeah, he's my friend, you know, and they use a phrase like man upstairs, which is not the phrase of someone who really understands who God is. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm not asking you if we're buddies. I'm not asking you if you're going to, you know, worship me uh, once in a while, a day, a week, or a year. He said, I want to know, Peter, do you love me with an unconditional love? And Sometimes this is how relationships seem to go, and I don't always understand it. It's like you'll see people when they're dating and in their engagement, and you'll see these guys open in the car, and you see the girl blowing the kiss, you know. And it's really sick when you think about it. We don't have time to get into that. But it's just amazing, you know. It takes them over. And then you see them a few years into marriage, and they're like, yeah, whatever. And they've, they've moved from this agape love to this phileo love. And Jesus is saying, look at Peter, I don't want this lip service, and I'm glad you like some stuff on Facebook, but listen, I want your face in my book. I want to have a relationship with you. Do you love me that way? You see, the fact is that Jesus is speaking in a little bit of a different level here. And a lot of times we're good at the lower level stuff. It's like the girl that wrote a note to her boyfriend. Dear Johnny, no words could ever express my unhappiness since you broke off our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. I love you. I love you. I love you. Love, Jane. P.S. Congratulations on winning the lottery. <laughs> you have people like that? They love you when it's going good. And boy, when Jesus was going to bring the kingdom in and it was triumphal entry day and the palms were going down, Hosanna, Hosanna. Man, Peter was like, yep, bringing it in. Here we go, here we go. I'm going to be one of the greatest in the kingdom. But when he put his foot in his mouth and when things weren't going too good, did he still love the Lord like that? Well, I'm going to really love the Lord if I get that promotion. I'll even do some of that tithing stuff. But then it didn't happen. Do we love him then? Lovest thou me, Peter? See, the Bible says in Mark 12, 30, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And there's a bunch of stuff I love to preach about, and if the Lord gives me a bunch more years, I'm going to keep preaching through books of the Bible, and I love doing that. But here's what I've learned in 31 years of pastoring this church. If we don't love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, hey, we can preach about witnessing and giving and serving and missions and all kinds of stuff. If we don't love Him, none of that's ever going to happen. Peter was never going to preach on the day of Pentecost until he got back in love with Jesus Christ. So by the definition of love, he's being proven. And then also by a decision he had to make. I want you to see this decision because he's being called from a life of serving self to a life of serving Christ. And it really develops background-wise in Luke twenty-two thirty-one. 31. Jesus is with Peter in the upper room, and he's telling his disciples now, he says, I want you to know that that you will be offended because of me. And Peter jumps up and he says, I'll not be offended. I'm not one of these wimps like the rest of these disciples. Tarzan, you know, oh, I'll be right there. That's why I like Peter. He kind of reminds me of mistakes I make. I can handle it. And sometimes you get into situations you cannot handle. And the Bible says in Luke 22, 31, notice what it says. The Lord said, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. By the way, how many of you know that Satan wants you anywhere but in this church? And Jesus said, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Jesus didn't say, If you fail, Peter, I'll be there for you. He said, When you fail, I pray that you'll be converted. The word converted speaks of being repentant. 
It speaks of coming back to Jesus again. It implies that even though Peter was saved, that there would be a time when he would perhaps be ashamed or drift, that when he recognized his sin, that he would need to return back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to say if you've been saved any length of time, there have probably been some times when you've had to come to an old-fashioned altar and with a heart of repentance say, Lord, I don't know what I've been thinking. I don't know why I've been going that direction. Forgive me, Lord. I want to come back to you. And that is exactly what the test was all about. It was loving Jesus enough to admit that he was wrong and come back to him. Look right here. It may not always be easy to come front and pray with someone or to go to someone and say, I'm sorry, or to tell the Lord that you're sorry, but it's sure a lot better than fishing in misery like Peter was doing. So there's a proving of his love. And then not only that, there's a, pr there's a proving by his labor. If you truly love the Lord, then Jesus had this phrase. All right, if you love me, Peter, feed my lambs. Let's say that together. Feed my lambs. So God is saying, if you truly love me, you'll labor. Now watch this. True love always labors. True love always labors. Now, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And when you love the Lord, you're going to feed his lambs. You're going to serve him in this way. And the idea is that of constantly nourishing others. In other words, Jesus knew that when he would ascend up into heaven and where he is today at the right hand of God the Father, that there would be men that he had chosen and trained who would turn the known world upside down. He knew what Peter was going to preach at Pentecost. He knew that thousands of people were going to get saved. And he knew that Peter, if that would be accomplished, must first love him with an undying love. And so we see the pursuit of Jesus three times. Again, here, there, coming for Peter. Just like he has pursued many of you by his grace. And then we see the proving of Peter. Peter, no, not, not Facebook love. An undying, unconditional love. The kind that serves the others in the flock. But then notice finally this morning, not only the pursuit of Christ and the proving of Peter, but we learn from this a lesson for ourselves, and that is the priority of the Christian. What is our priority today? And I want you to see this as we come down to verse number 18. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Now, verse 18 is literally a prophecy of the death of Peter. Jesus is saying, hey, when you're young, you can do everything the way you want to do it, but there's coming a day when it's going to be beyond your power and someone's going to carry you to your death. And in the meantime, Peter, there is to be a priority upon your life. And the priority is, first of all, a priority to serve. He says, I want you to feed my lambs. Hebrews 5 and 12 speaks of this. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. So watch this. When Jesus says, feed my sheep, He's referring to the Word of God. He's referring to the milk of the Word and the meat of the Word. A lot of people in recent days have accepted Christ as Savior. But those of us who know Jesus need to feed them and encourage them. Because as they begin their Christian life, they're not really sure. They're not uh, even comprehending perhaps the security that they have in Jesus Christ. And they need to hear 1 John 5.13. Uh, the Bible is very clear that, if, that, that every one of us that believe on the name of the Lord Jesus can know that we have eternal life. The Bible says, these things have I written unto thee that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And, and this is something that may be of a matter of milk for some of us, but it's something that many people need to hear today. Others may need to know of the deity of Christ, that in Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that he is 100% God and 100% man. Uh, the Bible speaks of him in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And, and Jesus is saying, hey, look at Peter, I need you to serve me. There's a lot of people that need to know who I am. There's a lot of people that need to understand the Christian life. I, I want you to go out and serve. But then he says, secondly, it's going to require sacrifice. It's going to require sacrifice. Now, verse 17 speaks of feeding, but verse 18 defines maybe the difficulty that could come to Peter's life. 
You see, everybody loves the idea of celebration and praise and worship. But in reality, while Jesus came to give us life more abundant and we do praise and worship him, the fact of the matter is it's much more than that to the disciple of Jesus. Sometimes it actually involves sacrifice to be a Christian. And this is what Todd was speaking about a moment ago. A little girl who would not care what everybody else thought and just sing the gospel of Jesus Christ. She took her stand. She was willing to take a stand for Jesus Christ. Peter writes about this later in his life. As the Holy Spirit moved upon him, he wrote in 1 Peter 4, 14, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. He said, look at it's a blessing. Sometimes you might be giving a gospel tract to someone, and you might say, I'd like to share this with you. It's about Jesus. They might say, keep it yourself. You know, it's amazing. People think it's nothing to go to Vegas and spend a couple hundred bucks, but to give that to a church, what kind of a cult are you in? Right? If you're going to live for Jesus, there might be some people who think you're a little nutty. There might be some days when it's not always like Sunday morning at church. It might be difficult. And he says, Peter, do you love me enough to suffer for me? Are you going to go all the way with me or is this just like Burger King? As long as you can have it your way, you're there with me. You see, Jesus is calling Peter to be a complete disciple. And this is a prophecy of the martyrdom of Peter. And in fact, history records that in 67 AD, Peter, simply for proclaiming Jesus Christ, was put on a cross and crucified. But because of his love for Jesus Christ, he would not be crucified facing up. He was crucified facing down. And he died a martyr for the faith that he had in Jesus Christ. And it's still happening today. Some of you heard of the Coptic Christians in Egypt Putting aside perhaps some of the theological discussions one could have, the fact of the matter is these are people that are proclaiming, self-proclaimed followers of Jesus Christ in Alexandria and Tanta two weeks ago, just going to church. And there were those strapped with bombs around them, and they came into the church, and boom, 45 people that professed Christ were blown apart. 45 lives were taken simply because they went into a church that was identified by the terrorists as a place where Christians worship. From November 1st, 2015 to October 30th, 2016, uh, there were 1,207 Christians uh, that were uh, martyrs for the Lord Jesus Christ and another 1,329 churches in that same period of time that were attacked uh, and many of them destroyed by people who hate Christ and hate Christianity. And you know, the truth of the matter is sometimes in this uh, day in which we live, uh, we get the idea that, you know, being a Christian is kind of like, you know, you put God on the God shelf and you add Jesus to your repertoire and as long as it's good and fun, great, if not, I'm out. But that's not the way Jesus began this faith. He said, if you're going to follow me, there may be some difficulty. And he said, before we get into this, I want to know, do you really, really love me? I've stood on this platform dozens of times and helped young couples as they come together in marriage. And every single time I've used that phrase, to love and to cherish till death do us part. You know, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish. Honestly, if I'm in premarital counseling and some, some guy sits there and goes, you know, I, I love her, man. She's a babe. And I want to be with her. You know, she's just awesome. But, you know, if she gets like polio or something, I'm checking out. You know what I'm going to say to that guy after I smack him? <laughs> I'm going to say, dude, you don't know what love is. Get out of here. She deserves someone better than you, huh? Amen. Come on, ladies. You can say amen to that. I'm trying to help you here. We're not, we're not going to play that game with marriage. Why do we play that game with Jesus? Hey, Jesus, I'm right there with you, but you know, if I can catch some overtime or, you know, Dodgers are playing or something, man's got to do what a man's got to do. But a disciple has to do what a disciple has to do. And that's what Jesus is teaching us today. I'm here. I'm alive, he says. I died for you. Will you live for me? Do you love me that much? And he just kind of summarizes this in verse 20, rather verse 19. He, it says, and when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. But now these words have a little different meaning. Because it's not like joining a church, like a club, like, hey, you know, follow me, ring around the rosy. No, no. When he says, follow me, Peter knows now. 
To be a disciple of Jesus means to love him above everything else. It means my job is a means to an end. It's not the God. It means if I'm not popular or even if I'm mistreated, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And Jesus says, follow me in two contexts. First, he says, follow me in the sense of salvation. In the sense of believing on him. For the Bible says there's none other name given under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. You know, a lot of people say, well, there's a lot of roads to heaven. Pick one, get on it, stick with it. All roads lead to the same place. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So when he says, follow me, he's telling us that his blood covers our sin. Without the shedding of the blood, there's no remission for our sin. He's saying, follow me, believe on me, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And if you've never been saved the Bible way, and you don't know that heaven is your home, then I say to you this morning, Follow Jesus. I don't want to point you to this church because the Baptist church can't take you to heaven and the Catholic church can't take you to heaven. No church can take you to heaven, but Jesus can take you to heaven. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. Jesus can take you to heaven. So follow him for salvation. But there are some of you here this morning, you've been saved, but you've been doing a lot of fishing. You know, discouragement comes and bad things happen. And, hey, where's so-and-so? He's fishing. Now, I love to fish. Don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with fishing. But when that's the state of your spiritual soul, that's not a good statement. And some of you need to be converted today as Christians. You need to come back to that place of saying, Lord, I want that first love like the church at Ephesus had. I want to come back to that place where I thought of you first thing in the morning, where I couldn't wait for church where I just love singing your praises. I need to get back there. That's where Peter needed to be. And that's where we need to be. Right there at his feet, following him as his disciples.